On October the 31st, 1517, Martin Luther posted 95 big questions which he believed faced the church of his day to a local church door in Wittenberg, Germany. 500 years later, I decided to post 95 new questions, one a week, to the web, questions which I believe the church must face in the 21st century. Love God, love others the way you love yourself, said Jesus. But it's easier said than done, especially when so many of us have been kicked and hurt, ridiculed and put down, shut out, sometimes even by those claiming to be the self-appointed representatives of Jesus. So before we go any further, here's what I've come to understand as one of life's key principles. Your well-being, your sense of self-worth, self-esteem and self-love is dependent on your theology rather than your critics or your mood. Critics come and go. Moods come and go. In the end, it's only a good theology which addresses your sense of meaning, of purpose and self-worth that has the power to sustain you through life. And for me, all this starts, as I said last week, with Genesis, the first book of the Bible and the very first page of the first book of the Bible. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to 27, reads this way. Then God said, let us make humanity in our image, in our likeness. So God created humanity in his own image, in the image of God he created them. Male and female he created them. Now, whether you're debating the philosophical challenge of what it means to be human, or at a much more personal level, struggling with why and if your life matters and what you're worth, for me, this is the starting place. It's the baseline. What does Genesis mean in its emphatic statement that we're all made in the image of God? Now, by the way, the phrase Imago Dei, which is Latin for image of God, is often used as a theological term in this context. And across the centuries, whole libraries have been written uh, around unravelling the puzzle of what this phrase means. Underneath it all, though, sit a number of foundational truths. To begin with, the phrase created in the image of God speaks of the fundamental, indissoluble relationship between humans and our Creator. We're created in such a way, this phrase suggests, that our sense of spirituality, our connection with our Creator, is hardwired into the core of our very being. But then, the fact that Genesis simply uses the term Imago Dei but fails to unpack its meaning in any further depth tells us something more. It assumes, of course, that its meaning did not need to be explained. And the only reason for this was that the concept was already widely understood by the people of that era. Genesis, like the other texts that make up our Bible, uh, uh, was not designed as a thesis to be debated by professors and PhD students, but instead as a practical document to bring hope, to bring comfort and encouragement to ordinary people as they lived out their lives in difficult and testing situations. So, whatever its precise meaning, the term the image of God must have made plain and obvious common sense to its original audience. In the ancient Near East, the idea was very common that an image of a god served as the dwelling place of the spirit of that god. A human being could therefore be the dwelling place of a deity and as a result be understood to be the image of that god. But of course, the most likely, the most common human being to fulfil this important role in any society was the king, who was regarded as the, as the sole lifelong incarnation of the local god. So, for instance, in ancient Egypt, the pharaoh was regarded as the image of the living god. But allied to this, it was also true that across the ancient Near East, any image of the king was seen as the representative of that king. 
So ancient Assyrian kings, for example, erected statues of themselves in territories that they'd conquered to represent their occupation of that land. For instance, a statue of an Armenian king dated around the 9th century BC discovered in northern Syria has an inscription on it where the statue itself is referred to as the image and likeness of the king. And it was also understood that these images were much more than symbolic portrayals of the monarch, the king. Instead, they stood in a spiritual union with him. They were his presence even when he was absent. Now, it's in this cultural context and with this understanding and as a response to it that the reference to the Imago Dei, the image of God, in Genesis 1 was written. We every man and every woman, all humanity, are created as God's representatives. One last life-changing fact. Reading through the whole of Genesis, there's no evidence at all that sin breaks or has the power to erode or destroy this divine image. Even St. Augustine agreed the image of God still remains. Genesis' claim is that each and every person, however far they wandered from God, continues to bear the imprint of God in their life. The image of God is permanent, indelible in all people. And this is seen by the continued usage of the term, for instance, in Genesis chapter 9, verse 6, where following the tale of Noah and the ark, the promise is made again to all humanity that they are in the image of God. Whatever the Imago Dei consists of, it's intrinsic to what it means to be a human being. It cannot be lost. I believe that this means that we are all, whatever our history, whatever our mistakes, whatever we've been told, whoever we are, image bearers and representatives of the God of all creation. And I also believe that when we stand before any other person, whoever they are, we always stand, as one writer put it, before another vehicle of the divine. So this week, just two questions. If this is true, what implications do you think it has for you as an individual and the way you view yourself? And secondly, what implications does it have for the church, locally, nationally, and around the world? <laughs>